Hi friends, this is the last session of this video series. In this session, we are going to try to answer some unanswered questions. So these unanswered questions come in different groups. Few questions are about symptomatology. Few questions are about basic pathogenesis. And few questions are about why neonatal concepts are useful in understanding COVID. So as far as first unanswered question we come across regularly in adult ICUs is so-called uncontrolled diabetes causing severe COVID. Many times it happens that a person who is actually not aware also that he is having severe diabetes or something, he lands up in ICU with COVID, sugar is done, sugars are very sky high. And then we label it as uncontrolled diabetes because insulin does not work very well. Very high doses of insulin are required. And this patient feels guilty that he has not taken medicine previously. So how to explain that? Whether COVID causes hyperglycemia or hyperglycemia causes severe COVID. It's very important from therapeutic point of view. Second question, commonly reported in many, many patients is loss of sense of taste and smell. When fever comes down, they report that they are unable to find the food tasty. They are unable to smell. So is there any way in which we can explain this common early symptom based on pathogenesis of progenitor cells? Next we'll come across what is the connection with newborn babies? Because basically this particular disease is new and it was not able to explain on classical ARDS model. An ARDS model is not there. Which model can explain this disease? Is this disease has been seen previously in neonates? Is there any neonatal connection with this disease? We'll see. And last, but very important, is during acute management of a patient who is actually worsening in the ICU, we are intubating the baby and we are trying to treat it. What we experience is that FIR2, if we increase, saturations increase slowly. We increase FIR2 further. Again, saturations increase. We increase FIR2 further. And we get a situation of shock, hypotension. So this is very crucial from acute perspective. So in that, we'll see in the typical situation, first situation is when increasing FIR2, PaO2 has not increased much because saturations have not become normal. And in that, deadly zone itself, we get pulmonary vasodilation because lungs become heavy because all the autopsies, they consistently tell us that after death, lungs are heavy. And when you back the patient at that time, lungs are light. That means compliance is actually quite good, very easy bagging. When they die, lungs are heavy. That means something is happening at the time of death, which makes the lung heavy. In fact, in one series of autopsy, has been found that lungs are double the normal. They are much, much heavier than even ARDS also. So how to explain this sudden pulmonary vasodilation? How they can accommodate such a large volume? Because pulmonary hypertension is quite common. Treatment is also quite common. But this phenomena does not happen in all. It happens only in COVID. Why in COVID they are able to accommodate large blood volumes? What is the exact location? In last session, we discussed about 2.5 millimeter diameter of vessel. What is the evidence for that? And why does cardiac dysfunction occur in these patients? So let us see the first. What is the situation where the FIR2 is rising? Original protocol is give FIR2 100% and rapidly come down. But we observe, if you follow this protocol, we invariably end up creating shock. So if we are using high FIR2, Alveolar O2 is increased. PaO2 is not yet increased. Saturation has increased only from 60 to 85. At that particular time, this particular vessel, that is pre-capillary artery, this is the sensor. Now this sensor has been given two commands. Alveolar oxygen is telling to dilate and arterial oxygen is telling to constrict. Now when ordered from two sides, how the sensor will behave? This explanation we'll see today. Explanation is very simple. Distance matters. For example, if a junior person is there, 
one right one senior is sitting besides one senior is on phone one person is telling to intubate one person is like don't intubate whom the junior person will listen whoever is near who is easily accessible distance matters as well as this signaling is concerned so we'll see how is the distance actually now let us see what are the sensors here sensors are nothing but mitochondria these are the small small mitochondria these mitochondria are susceptible for oxygen so the oxygen enters mitochondria depending on cytosolic oxygen they go for either reduced state or oxidized state depending on this redox potential this mitochondria ask the cell that is smooth muscle cell these are the spindle shaped cells smooth muscle cells in wall of pre capillary artery depending on that they act so if this oxygen is low then they go for vasoconstriction if oxygen is high they go for vasodilation now let us see suppose this is the pre capillary artery wall and this particular artery wall is being ordered from two sides so let us compare distance of this pre capillary artery wall smooth muscle and mitochondria what is distance here and what is distance here so if you see these are the endothelial cells this is the blood in the endothelial cells these are the smooth muscle cells these are the very small flat pneumocyte type 1 where and here is the alveolus now we have got a situation where here there is increase o2 here there is decrease o2 how it behaves we'll see so these are the type 1 pneumocytes very flat type 1 pneumocytes are not the primary target of covid primary target of covid is type 2 pneumocytes so type 1 pneumocytes are there these pneumocytes are very thin and we can see what is the dimension it is very thin 0.1 to 0.2 micron and if you see endothelial cells these are the endothelial cells and what is the dimension here 1 to 2 micron now we can compare that the distance between the arterial blood and the sensor is pretty high and the distance between the alveolar oxygen and this sensor is very low so in short this has got more impact rather than arterial so your message here is very simple that is when you are giving oxygen to any covid patient don't get deceived by a saturation if you end up giving very high fir2 will end up causing more vasodilation so this more vasodilation will happen irrespective of saturation not being optimal that's why we are repeatedly stressing that these patients when they crash don't you prophylactically high 100% fir2 go for 60% fir2 let the saturation rise slowly this 60% saturation 70% 75 85 wait for some time don't turn up this fir2 knob very frequently otherwise we'll end up causing hypotension patient who was hypoxic without shock we end up converting into patient borderline oxygen but with shock and then saturation also comes down so this is the explanation why in case of contractile signals this pulmonary vessels pulmonary vascular smooth muscles they behave more with fir2 rather than saturation in short you less fir2 now let us go for the next part we know that pulmonary vasoconstriction is very common pulmonary hypertension is also very common we give oxygen liberally quite commonly but this phenomena does not happen in all it happens only with covid why it happens because if the vasoconstriction is opened then extra blood will come this extra blood will naturally go ultimately to heart but instead here it stays in lung lungs are cooled with blood reperfusion flooding of lung is happening why is that a study nice study has been done by ackerman where they compared autopsy findings of seven lung tissue lung samples which are normal seven lung samples of covid expired and seven lung samples of influenza tests and they have come across a very important finding that covid deaths are accompanied with what we call as interceptive angiogenesis angiogenesis what is angiogenesis is formation of blood vessels this happens in two fashions one is sprouting second is interceptive this interceptive angiogenesis is commonly seen when we go for exercise during exercise what happens metabolic demand is increased and new vessels are formed this new vessel formation is a hallmark of covid how it happens is depicted in this figure 
we can see this this is the blood vessel now what is happening initially there was single lumen then one pillar formation starts this is called interceptive pillar now this pillar keeps on growing towards each other now at the end the complete separation is established now this one vessel has been converted into two vessels so this particular interceptive angiogenesis has been observed in those patients especially those who are ill admitted for pretty long time this can explain what happens at the end many hospitals they are intubated somehow they still they go in shock they are managed somehow and only to lose them after some time because during that period this interceptive angiogenesis is happening this interceptive angiogenesis is creating more and more number of vessels this increased number of vessels what is the effect now this increased number of vessels is happening because there is low shear stress in those parts of the wall wall of this vessel in those vessels here there is low shear stress this interceptive pillar forms means what wherever a blood flow is fluctuating when blood flow is fluctuating they respond by forming extra vessels now this extra vessels has got impact extra vessels are being formed as a defense mechanism ideally initially these extra vessels are being formed as a defense mechanism here this single vessel has been converted into number of vessels now what happened this single vessel has been converted into number of vessels this is actually good thing because extra blood is being delivered to lungs what happens here is because of that cross sectional area increases the cross sectional area this is less than combined cross sectional area this that means now the lung especially the small vessels capillaries they can accommodate much much larger volume of blood without increasing pressure this is very important without increasing pressure it has been observed that pulmonary hemorrhage does not happen commonly in these cases pulmonary hemorrhage will happen only when pressure is increased but here lung contains lot of blood without increasing pressure because it is able to accommodate large amount of volume without increasing pressure because so many vessels are available there is large area available and another peculiar thing they observed ackerman that this particular thrombosis is happening at vessels which are smaller than 1 mm or at the most 1 to 2 mm in diameter and the constriction is happening at 2.5 so 2.5 constriction and thrombosis at 1 to 2 that means thrombosis appears to be secondary to hypoperfusion not other way around so thrombosis happens but thrombosis appears to be secondary to obstruction and in all autopsy findings they observed that there is congestion of pulmonary capillaries large amount of pulmonary capillaries large amount of new angiogenesis so this can explain that once this vasoconstriction is opened up this lung can hold large amount of volume that means stolen from systemic perfusion so you have got situation with heavy lung with shock now what is this exact location we mentioned about 2.5 mm diameter pre capillary artery how do we know that how do we know that is because of trans experiment or study done with hrcp before that we'll come to know diameter of 2.5 means the cross sectional area of 5 mm square so now one words rather than 2.5 we refer it as 5 mm square so let us see that study a very interesting study look at these figures these figures are self explanatory now these are the figures of hrct high resolution ct scan now this study has been taken comparing 100 more than 100 controls and more than 100 covid patients what they do here in this hrct they look for tubular structures now there are two types of tubular structures here one is airway second is vessels now airway they bypass what remains is vessels now in vessels they divide these vessels based on size or that is cross sectional area we can see some are red some are yellow some are blue who are red the small ones are red smallest ones less than 5 mm square cross sectional area what are intermediate yellow and we are big or blue now this is the normal lung now we can see the blood volume distribution in normal lung what is happening once you look at the figure we can see what strikes you is red red everywhere there is a red red so majority of blood volume 
is in small vessels. That is less than 5 millimeters square. Intermediate, there are a lot of yellow also. You can see a lot of yellow here. And very last, a small amount of blood volume is in blue. So, in other words, in normal lung or non-COVID lung, what we see is blood accommodated predominantly in smallest vessels. And what happens in COVID? Opposite. This dramatically opposite is happening here. We can say the red has disappeared. Red has gone. And what is replaced by is only yellow and blue. Lot of blue here. Lot of yellow here. And red has disappeared. So this is a very important study, which tells the basic pathophysiology of COVID, where the blood is pooled in larger vessels. Blood is not allowed to go in smaller vessels. Why? Only two reasons, either extensive thrombosis or extensive vasoconstriction. Thrombosis is not universal. Vasoconstriction is universal. Vasoconstriction observed only in alive. Congestion observed only in dead. So, that is typical redistribution of this blood flow is depicted in this graph. Now we can see there are two graphs. On x-axis, there is cross-sectional area. Small vessels, big vessels, bigger vessels, biggest vessels. Now blood volume percentage on y-axis. Now let us see first healthy individuals, non-COVID patients. Now we can see this area. The maximum amount of blood volume has been stored in very small, small vessels. That is less than five. And in COVID, what happens is a redistribution happens. That is, these small blood vessels, they actually get empty, and bigger vessels, they get full. Now, what happens to blood volume? Blood volume is same. Blood volume is not changed. And we are telling blood volume is more because it happens at terminal event, the end, end, end result. So in alive, even if COVID is there, there is vasoconstriction. There is the distribution has been changed, redistribution is happening, but blood volume remains the same. Now, this extra blood volume comes only at the end because lungs are very heavy after death. So, let us see, focus more on this part. So, for if you zoom in this part more, then we can see again. Now, we can see very clearly. In normal lung, normal lung, this is blue, normal lungs. In this case, this is cut off, five. Less than five, majority of blood volume is stored. In COVID lung, it is redistributed to this, that is 5 to 10. So re this redistribution is a self-evident that something is happening at junction between 5 and 10, that is vasoconstriction. So this vasoconstriction is the hallmark of COVID. So now we can pictorially describe it. First of all, let us come to the lower figure, normal blood vessel, normal pulmonary blood vessel. This is arterial, this is venule, this is the capillary. This capillary is very small, less than 5 mm square area. Majority of blood is here. This is being converted into this situation in COVID. That is, lot of blood, less blood, again lot of blood. So that means there is something happening at this. And that is the vasoconstriction. So in other words, vasoconstriction at 5 mm square cross-sectional area or same vasoconstriction at 2.5 mm diameter is the hallmark of COVID. So now let us see the last part. Why heart is affected? Nowadays we are getting plenty of angiography negative myocardial infarction. Or we can call it in a cardiology term STEMI. S-T-E-M-I. ST elevation myocardial infarction. STEMI. In this STEMI, we expect that angiography will throw some thrombosis, some obstruction. And majority of these cases are having complete normal angiography. Negative angiography. So, why this heart is affected? Why the heart develops ischemia? They come with actually completely like AMI in young. So what is the effect of COVID on heart? Or effect of this vasoconstriction on heart? Now we know that there is widespread pulmonary vasoconstriction. Because of this widespread pulmonary vasoconstriction, right ventricle is difficult to pump. Right ventricular afterload is increased. So they develop right ventricular systolic dysfunction. Now, systole is so much prolonged that it actually encroaches on diastole of neighbor, that is left ventricle. This right ventricle systolic dysfunction leads to right ventricle diastolic dysfunction. Now, the right ventricle diastolic dysfunction encroaches on functioning of neighbor, that is left ventricle. Now, this left ventricle diastolic dysfunction, last is left ventricle systolic dysfunction. Now, what is the importance of this systolic, diastolic, systolic, diastolic? In therapeutic implication here is, Systolic dysfunction, we can treat easily with inotopes. Diastolic dysfunction, we can't. 
That's why dysfunction is very difficult to manage. We have to go to the root cause and we have to treat. What is the root cause here? Root cause here is widespread pulmonary vasoconstriction. Means if the patient is not given sufficient oxygen, then heart will fail. So sufficient oxygen is very important. Appropriate, sufficient, never excessive, never inappropriate. But sufficient oxygen is must to prevent this, this sort of worsening. So we discussed about location of vasoconstriction, effects of vasoconstriction, effects of new angiogenesis. And now we'll go to the next part. That is why there is encroachment. Here, this one we can see, this right ventricle, left ventricle, there is, this is interventricular septum. Now, right, right ventricle is stretched so much, then equal also, we find that this interventricular septum is bulging into left ventricle. The left ventricle can't function properly. And when left ventricle additional problem comes up, they go in shock. And this additional problem comes up because of pooling of blood in lung. So these are the important questions as far as pathogenesis is concerned. Next important thing is why we are actually talking on that. What is the relation between neonate and this COVID? In neonate, we come across plenty of complications. Before that, we'll try to solve this thrombosis problem. So thrombosis and endothelitis and thromboinflammation has been implicated in COVID. So this thrombosis and thromboinflammation is actually happening. Now, is it primary or secondary is unknown. What are the ways in which the thrombosis can happen? Is our pathogenesis complementary to thrombosis pathogenesis? We'll see. As we know, Virchow's triad, we'll know, is a famous Virchow's triad. That is, thrombosis will happen if one or more of these following factors are operating. That is, whenever there is reduced flow, whenever there is endothelial damage, whenever there is hypercoagulability of blood, then thrombosis happens. Usually for thrombosis, it requires more than one. That is shock, endothelial injury, and blood has become more prone for coagulation. So how all three happen in COVID, we'll see. First of all, we'll go through flow. Now, how, what are the conditions when flow is reduced, even in lungs as well as systemic circulation. As we already know, vasoconstriction is happening. Vasoconstriction can lead to reduced flow. Ultimately, shock is happening at the end. Shock leads to reduced flow. Reperfusion flooding. Lung is stealing blood from systemic circulation. So all these three things, that is shock, reperfusion pooling of blood, and vasoconstriction, they are prone to cause reduced flow. This is just imagining. There is no evidence for this yet. Second is endothelial damage. One theory is this virus actually affects the endothelial cell. Virus has been actually found in endothelial cell. There is a problem. This virus has not been identified as coronavirus. The classical coronavirus, that infection, cell infection, criteria is it should be in vacuum. This has been not found yet in endothelium. It has not, classical picture of coronavirus has not been depicted. But there is doubt that this virus can affect endothelium. Why? Endothelial also are having endothelial progenitor cells. It has been observed that those organs, which are actually having a lot of progenitor properties, they suffer more from thrombosis. So this virus can lead to endothelial injury, hypercoagulability. We actually have to remember that heparin, whatever injection heparin we are giving, is being prepared from two sources. That is porcine intestine and bovine lungs. So bovine lung is a very rich source of heparin. Lungs produce heparin especially mast cells of lung produce heparin. So in those situations, lung is affected or lung is bypassed, this heparin is not available for body. Second is paradoxical embolism. We already discussed that whenever there is right atrial hypertension, the PFO, patent prominoin opens up. This PFO can be a source of paradoxical embolism. Small, small emboli on right side of heart can find their way into left side of heart. Plus, in COVID, there is a dysfunction of liver. Already we already we uh, found that progenitor cells are present in liver. That is the junction of hepatocyte and cholangiocyte. A lot of progenitor cells are there. They are important for regeneration, repair of liver injury. So if that repair is less, then actually liver dysfunction can happen. So these are the three ways in which COVID can have thrombosis. How to prevent that? Till now, we depended only on low molecular heparin or heparin. This is empirical. Along with that, we observed that many patients who are already given heparin, still they develop thromboembolic complications. That is, only heparin is not actually sufficient. We have to take care of shock also. We have to prevent this reperfusion pooling also. So if we take care of all, then only we can actually prevent 
this thrombosis tendency in COVID. Now we'll go to the neonatal connection. What is connection with neonate? Why this patient is not behaving classically like RDS? When COVID epidemic started, we thought initially that it is nothing but new RDS, ARDS. But this ARDS protocol did not work here. ARDS requires very high pressure, requires very high oxygen, and it's entirely different uh, style of ventilation. Here, the compliance is low, easy to ventilate, hypoxia is disproportionate, and sudden shock is happening. So, is there any model in neonate which can present with all three actually components? There is no one model. There are three different models in neonate. First model comes up depends on alveolar collapse. Alveolar collapse is hallmark of COVID, we know, because it is obvious by ground glass appearance on CT. This alveolar collapse is commonly happening in preterm neonate because of surfactant deficiency. Second is hypoxia, especially on activity. The person is not hypoxic at rest. But when he talks, moves around, then he becomes hypoxic. This is very commonly observed in the neonatal PPHN. The third is partial response to oxygen, especially we discussed in happy hypoxia. Hypoxia does not respond completely to administered oxygen. This is also commonly seen in congenital somatic heart diseases with right to left shunts. So is there any similarity here? We'll see. Shock after intubation. This is commonly observed in neonate in different formats. When in neonate we give surfactant, many patients they develop left ventricle dysfunction and they go for shock and pulmonary hemorrhage. In many patients of meconium stain like with meconium aspiration syndrome, when you ventilate them, they develop pulmonary hemorrhage and shock. This tendency has been observed in neonates. And how it can be extrapolated to adult, we'll see. First of all, we'll see this the airway, and this is alveolus. This alveolus is very small, it is collapsed alveolus. Next thing we can see. Is, this is the alveolus, which is surrounded by the capillary plexus, and this is pre-capillary arteriole, and then venule. And we can already saw that this is the location. That is 2.5 millimeter diameter of pre-capillary artery. Then we see this is the intrapulmonary shunt. This lung is being ventilated, but this this uh, this uh, this lung is actually ventilated poorly. So this collapsed alveolus. Ideally, blood should have been like, diverted. It is not diverted. This continues to be perfuse. Ventilation is poor, perfusion is too good. Ventilation is poor, that's why it is useless alveolus. This useless alveolus continues to be perfused by this artery. So this is called intrapulmonary shunt. And last is ARDS. Now this ARDS and neonatal RDS, the common factor is hyaline membrane disease. Hyaline membranes are observed in both. Additionally, this intraalveolar edema and this interstitial edema is very, very pronounced in case of this ARDS. So in other words, this is neonatal RDS, this is neonatal PPHN, this is neonatal congenital somatic heart disease occurring on the background of adult RDS, that is ARDS. So it is this particular thing we can actually summarize. Ground glass opacities, just like neonatal RDS, hypoxia activity, just like neonatal PPHN, con comfortable hypoxia, just like congenital somatic heart disease happening in ARDS background. This is the neonatal connection of this. Since these phenomena are commonly observed in neonatal period, because of that only we got interested in pathogenesis of this disease, which is happening in adults. Now we'll go to the last part of this presentation. Most important part from therapy point of view is why they keep on throwing up different, different symptoms and different, different manifestations. It is changing, it is evolving, this disease. But if you see the cell, cellular basis, what we discussed in, uh, initially, then majority questions can be answered. This is a very extensive study done in Coimbatore lab along with Harvard collaboration. So what they did is 100 million, it is not a small number, big number, 100 million biomedical documents. What is biomedical documents is DNA, RNA material by SCRNA, that is single cell RNA. They did this extensive search or what are the cells in body which are actually susceptible to COVID? Those cells which express ACE2 receptor. So if you see the distribution of these cells, it is actually all over. It looks too extensive, right? From nose up to testes. Everywhere there are, we can find cells which are actually expressing ACE2. Now, for us, what are important? For us, what is important is this. This is olfactory epithelial cells. Now, once we know this olfactory epithelial cells are affected, 
we know that this affection can lead to anosmia. Second thing comes up is tongue. Tongue also is affected. That can explain loss of sense of taste. And lung, type 2 pneumocytes, we saw previously, that is P type of COVID and Clara cells. Clara cells. These Clara cells actually are quite central in pathogenesis of COVID. Now we'll go to actually what are the distribution of this ACE2 receptor in different different systems, in respiratory system, in GIT, how it is distributed. And then we'll try to answer the unanswered questions. Let us see now. Now this is explanation of why hyperglycemia occurs in COVID. Now very important is, now look at the x-axis. These are percent of cells with expression, that is of expression of ACE2. This is the ACE2 versus cell type, nothing but ACE2 density. Already we discussed that with age, the progenitor cells come down. But with age, the ACE2 receptor expression density keeps on increasing. So that's why older people are more susceptible to get COVID. They are more susceptible to get severe COVID also. Now, if we see this figure very carefully, we zoom in into only one part. That is this. This PP cells. What are the PP cells? They are pancreatic polypeptide secreting cells. We heard previously about pancreas, alpha cells, beta cells. Now we are dealing about gamma cells, that is PP cells. These are the PP cells. These are the cells with maximum expression. Maximum, this PP cell is actually highest as far as this cells with expression are concerned. So those cells with ACE2, the maximum percentage is finding PP cells. Now how this PP cell is related with hyperglycemia we'll see. Next interesting part, as we discuss, another evidence of our hypothesis is Clara cell. Now Clara cell is the cell with maximum expression of this ACE2 receptor. Compared to all other cells, Clara cell is maximum. But where these pneumocytes stand, here we can see type 2 pneumocytes. So Clara cell and pneumocyte is nothing but C-type COVID and P-type COVID. Now this Clara cell, pneumocyte, PP cells, they are actually more targets of I will see what actually happens in COVID as far as sugar is concerned. For that, we have to go to the islets of Langerhans. In the islets of Langerhans, we get alpha cell. Alpha cell secretes glucagon. Glucagon has got effect on sugar, which is diametrically opposite to insulin. Beta cell secretes insulin. Beta cell, beta cell insulin. Now, this insulin, function of this insulin is to bring down the sugar. How it does? It acts on liver. Liver is the main manufacturing hub of sugar in body. So insulin acts on liver and insulin tries to reduce the sugar. Now let us see the third type, our interest type, that is COVID target. Our COVID target is not alpha cell, is not beta cell, but it is gamma cell. Previously we used to call gamma cell. Now we are calling it PP cell, that is pancreatic polypeptide cell. This cell is liberating polypeptides. For this polypeptide is when observed, this polypeptide facilitates this action. Now, insulin alone can't act on liver independently. For this action to happen, it must have polypeptide, pancreatic polypeptide. Now things become clear. What are the clear now? This PP, that is polypeptide, has got central role in regulation of sugar. Examples where this type of diabetes happens are inflammation of pancreas, that is pancreatitis, or resection of pancreas. Or pancreatic tumors. In these cases, even if you give insulin, this diabetes does not improve. And it improves when we can give PP, that is pancreatic polypeptide. Or these cases require very, sometimes require very high doses of insulin. Nothing but insulin resistance. So this insulin resistance has been attributed to deficiency of PP. Now let us see what happens in COVID. In COVID, as we know, virus is completely blind, deaf and mute. Virus needs only ACE2 and cofactor. This ACE2 in cofactor is available in PP cells in pancreas. Now, these PP cells in pancreas, because of this virus, they get dysfunction. Because of this dysfunction, they cause insulin resistance. Even if insulin is available, it can't bind liver. There are studies have been done in experimental animals where the liver cells have been demonstrated receptors for actually this PP. So now, because of this insulin resistance, there is hyperglycemia. So in other words, COVID directly can lead to hyperglycemia, so-called uncontrolled diabetes. 
So COVID has got effect on sugar. COVID leads to hyperglycemia and it requires higher than usual insulin doses. So anticipate that COVID patients, especially elderly COVID patients can have hyperglycemia, which will be difficult to treat. That doesn't mean he was already having uncontrolled diabetes. He became uncontrolled diabetes because of COVID. So now let us go further. Another interesting phenomena, what we see in beginning of this illness, we develop loss of sense of taste. Now, as we know, test is because of test buds. Now, these test buds are actually undergoing very rapid turnover. They get renewed very fast within a few days. Now, our focus is two types of papillae. Here, there are got foliate papillae and valiate papillae. These are the valid papillae. These are the foliate, pap foliate papillae on sides. Sides of tongue and the junction of posterior one-third and anterior two-third. This is the site of affection of COVID. How do we know about that? Because it has been observed by this study of cells that this circumvallate and foliate papillary junction, there are trenches, that means there are depressions. And bottom of these trenches, they have observed this progenitor cells with marker for progenitor. So already we know in tongue, there are progenitor cells which are the target of COVID. And if they are affected, test buds are affected. Test buds are affected, we get loss of sense of taste. So this particular thing can also extrapolate it to smell. Smell, we know that it is because of olfactory epithelium. Now this olfactory epithelium contains two types of cells with progenitor property. One is globose basal cells and horizontal basal cells. They have got progenitor properties and they can be a target of this COVID. Already we know that ACE2 expression is present in olfactory epithelium. So once they are affected, we get loss of sense of smell. So these are the ways in which almost all the clinical features of COVID can be very easily explained on this hypothesis about progenitor. So as far as this session is concerned, this is just the beginning of answering the question. This is the last session in our video series. But main carry on message I want to give to everybody that this is a progenitor disease. Multiple targets are there. Multiple tissues can be involved. The predominant tissue is lung, where Clara cell and pneumocyte 2 is affected. Clara cell leads to C-type COVID. Pneumocyte 2 leads to P-type COVID. In one type, we can get distress without hypoxia. We can get hypoxia without distress. When you are treating this patient, we have to treat actually with respiratory support, that is oxygen. Oxygen must be given in sufficient amount so as to prevent pulmonary vasoconstriction. It's a dynamic process. Adjust the oxygen according to need. Never give too much oxygen, which will lead to hyperoxia and sudden pulmonary vasodilation. Especially at the time of intubation, never use 100% FIR2, use 60% FIR2, and then we can go up according to need. I anticipate that saturation won't be normal immediately. Aim for slow rise of saturation. Also avoid the avoid Valsava-like maneuver by intubated patient with judicious use of sedation. Even in non-ventilated patients, patient education to avoid straining of stools, coughing, laughing, talking on phone for a long time. This will go a long way in preventing sudden worsening of these unfortunate patients. So this was an attempt to actually communicate what is the available evidence, data available in public domain. And further research is required to unravel this mystery. So uh, thanks a lot for listening to all the videos. Please share these videos to people who are actually treating with COVID and especially to people who are taking care of frontline workers that only saturation is not uh, sufficient, only symptom of distress is not sufficient, respiratory monitoring as well as saturation, both should be done in COVID positive patients and their contacts. Thanks a lot. Best of luck.